Hello guys and welcome back to Counter 10. Today we're continuing our series looking at cardiac physiology with our topic today being myocardial O2 supply and demand. Now this topic should be quick. There's only two learning objectives as per MAC 95. But in saying that, this is a key topic when it comes to cardiac physiology, not just for the part one exam, but also for the part two exam. As always, at the end, we'll look at the previous SAQs, break down the examiner report, and look at some model answers. So with that said, let's dive straight into it. Now the first learning objective is describe the anatomy of the heart including the coronary circulation and the territories supplied. To begin this learning objective we have to look at the heart on a macroscopic level. So the heart is irregularly conical in shape. It's placed obliquely in the middle of the mediastinum. Its relationship to other structures within the mediastinum and the chest can be described by the fact that it's surrounded by a pericardium and this pericardium has both a visceral layer and a parietal layer. The inferior part of the pericardium binds onto the base of the central tendon of the diaphragm. So with this, because it's actually bound to the diaphragm, the heart actually moves up and down with inspiration and expiration. On the lateral side of the heart, you have the phrenic nerve. And this is really important whenever you're doing any type of surgery on the heart. Always think that there can be damage potentially to the phrenic nerve, which can then lead to hemiparalysis of the diaphragm. Now looking at the heart in more detail, you can classify the structure of the heart based on the type of muscles. So you have the endocardium, which is the endothelial surface that lines the inside of the chambers. You have the myocardium, which is where the cardiomyocytes sit. And then you have the epicardium, which is the mesothelial layer that lines the outside. And then when we talk about the chambers and the valves of the heart, some of these things are really self-explanatory, but just to go over it, we have four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. Both are divided respectively onto the right hand side and the left hand side. The right atrium is the one that receives the blood from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, as well as the coronary sinus, and has a tricuspid valve which ensures unidirectional blood flow into the right ventricle. Within the right ventricle you have the chordae tendini, which attach the edges of the atrioventricular valves to the papillary muscles within the ventricle itself. The right ventricle ejects blood through the pulmonary valve, which is also known as a semilunar valve because of the three cusps that make up the valve. That blood that's ejected out of the right ventricle then goes from the main pulmonary artery trunk, coming back via the pulmonary veins, of which there are four, and these drain into the left atrium, and the site at which the pulmonary veins join into the left atrium is a change of tissue and this is why this area is very prone to causing arrhythmias, specifically atrial fibrillation. Now the left atrium drains blood into the left ventricle via the mitral valve. The unique thing about the mitral valve is that it only has two papillary muscles. It has the posterior medial papillary muscle and the anterior lateral papillary muscle. The significance of this is that the posterior and medial papillary muscle only receives blood supply from the right coronary artery, while the anterior and medial has dual blood supply from the left coronary artery as well as the left circumflex artery. So if you are to have an MI that affects the RCA blood supply, this can lead to compromised papillary muscle and potentially cause sequelae like papillary muscle rupture. In comparison, this is less likely to happen with the anterior lateral papillary muscle. Then, as the blood goes into the left ventricle, it ejects out of another semilunar valve known as the aortic valve. This also has three cusps. Here you have the left coronary cusp, which has the left coronary ostium as the origin of the left main coronary artery. You have the right coronary cusp, which has the coronary ostium for the right main coronary artery. And then you have a non-coronary cusp, which has no origins for any arteries. That's as much basic anatomy you need to know of the heart. So we'll move on and talk about a key thing, which is the blood supply of the heart. 
Now the right main coronary artery passes between the pulmonary trunk and the right atrium to descend in the right part of the atrioventricular groove. At its terminal end, it anastomoses with the left coronary artery at the inferior intraventricular groove. Now before we get to the terminal end, we have to know the branches of the right main coronary artery. The most important branch is the posterior descending artery. Now this goes between the posterior intraventricular groove between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. In majority of people, the posterior descending artery comes off the RCA. However, in a small subset of people, it can also come off the LCA. The importance of this is that whichever side it comes from, we refer to this as the dominant side. So in majority of the people, because it comes from the right coronary artery, their right coronary artery is a dominant circulation side. Now we all know the classic features of an inferior MI on an ECG being ST elevation in lead 2, 3 and AVF. However, there can be some tricky patterns that involve the right coronary artery that you don't really want to miss on an ECG. And one of those is a posterior myocardial infarct. This is when the posterior descending artery is the culprit and you pick this up on an ECG through subtle signs. So V1, V2 and V3 are also a reflection of the posterior surface of the heart, specifically the posterior wall of the left ventricle. Now because the posterior descending artery goes between the intraventricular groove, it's supplying both the left ventricular posterior wall and the right ventricular posterior wall. So if you notice on an ECG in lead V1, V2 and V3, there is ST depression and T wave inversion, but in all the other leads there are no changes. In the back of your mind with the clinical history, you have to be worried about a posterior myocardial infarct. The way you pick this up is by getting extra leads on your ECG. So this is when you do a lead seven, eight or nine, which wraps around the back of the heart. And the classic pattern in these leads would be a classic ST elevation that you'd see with a STEMI. The other weird pattern you don't want to miss out with a right coronary infarct is a right ventricular infarction. Now 40% of right ventricular infarctions are associated with an inferior infarction, so they shouldn't be overlooked easily. When you have a classic picture of an inferior STEMI on your ECG, so elevation in lead 2, 3 and AVF, as well as ST elevation in lead V1 and V2, and no other changes in those other chest leads, you need to be thinking about this in the back of your head. The important reason you want to pick this up is because if the right ventricle is heavily compromised, our standard algorithm of treating someone with an MI, which involves GTN, which as you know, drops a patient's preload, can in this instance lead to a significant cardiovascular collapse and an arrest. So if you're unsure, what you need to do is get a reverse ECG. So this is when you place the chest leads, so V1 to V6, on the right hand side, exactly in the same placement of the left hand side. If these leads come back with ST elevation, you can be pretty sure that you have a right ventricular infarction. So to summarize these two types of infarctions with right coronary artery circulation, you have the classic inferior infarction, and then from this, you have a right ventricular infarction or you can get a posterior myocardial infarction. The other reason why right coronary artery infarctions are crap is because of the other arteries the right coronary artery supplies. So while the posterior descending artery is the main branch and you need to know that, the right main coronary artery also has a branch to the SA node in 60% of people, a branch to the AV node in 80% of the people, a branch to the right atrium, and then a posterior lateral artery branch. So the reason why all these are crap is because if someone has an issue in the right main coronary artery circulation, you can get weird and wonderful presentations with patients having not only an infarction, but weird AV blocks, weird bundle branch blocks, and just weird conduction pathologies like a bradyarrhythmia. If you see any of these signs, in conjunction with an infarction picture, these are all bad signs for a major infarction. Now in comparison, the left main coronary artery is pretty straightforward. 
This divides into its two main branches, being the left circumflex artery, which runs laterally around the left border of the heart. It gives off some smaller arteries, mainly the left marginal branch and the left posterior lateral branch. Then the other main branch from your left main coronary artery is your left anterior descending artery. This runs down the intraventricular groove anteriorly, so it's just parallel to the posterior descending artery. And these have the smaller branches being the diagonal 1, diagonal 2, diagonal 3 arteries that you'll classically read on your angio reports. And at the end of this left anterior descending artery, it wraps around the apex and it has a normal variability on how far it ends. And this is where the anastomosis or the blood flow is connecting from the posterior descending artery. Now that's the arterial supply in a nutshell. So going from the arteries, you go to the capillaries. Not much to say here in terms of the capillaries of the heart, except for the fact that the density of them is very high. And that makes logical sense when you think about the fact that they're facilitating a huge delivery of oxygen on a constant basis to a myocardium that's consuming a lot of oxygen. From those capillaries, we get the veins. And the veins follow a very similar pattern to the arteries. They just have a different name. And the four main ones you should know are the great cardiac vein. So this is just running along the left anterior descending. You have the middle cardiac vein, which is running along the posterior descending artery. You have the small cardiac vein, which is running along the marginal arteries, which is running along the left atrium. All of these veins are draining into the coronary sinus, into the right atrium. But the important bit to remember here is that not all the blood running in the veins goes into the right atrium. Approximately 95% will go into the right atrium, but 5% will find its way either directly into the ventricle or directly into other chambers through Thebysian veins, causing the normal physiological shunt. One important vein to remember if you ever get into cardiothoracic anesthesia is the anterior cardiac vein. Now this drains blood from the right ventricle and returns the blood directly into the right atrium, not through the coronary sinus. The significance is that all cardiac veins have no valves, so when you're doing cardioplegia using a retrograde circuit, when you're placing that cardioplegia through the coronary sinus, you can sometimes miss getting all the right ventricle. Therefore, you might not get a unified cardiac standstill. I think it's just a cool fact to know. The chance that you'll be asked that during your cardiac term is pretty low, but it's a nice thing to have in the back of your brain. So that brings us to the end of our first learning objective. The second learning objective is describe the factors determining myocardial oxygen supply and demand and their clinical implications. Now, myocardial supply can be defined by a simple equation, which is coronary blood flow times the arterial content of oxygen. From previous respiratory podcasts, we already know how to calculate the arterial content of oxygen. This is the Huffner's constant times the concentration of Hb times the saturations plus the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in blood. What we don't know is the normal coronary blood flow. So in the normal setting, coronary blood flow is equal to 250 mils of blood per minute. And if you were to say it in another way, you would say that normal coronary blood flow is 80 mils per minute per 100 grams of heart. Now, normal adult heart weighs 300 grams, and this coronary blood flow is equal to 5% of the total cardiac output. During strenuous exercise, we have the ability to take this baseline value and increase it by fourfold. So in a strenuous situation, coronary blood flow can be as high as 1,000 mils per minute or 400 mils per minute per 100 grams of heart tissue. The unique thing about the heart's coronary blood flow is that it has a very high extraction ratio. The extraction ratio of a normal resting heart is approximately 65 to 75% of the blood oxygen that's delivered. Now, what took me a long time to understand is that with this number, it doesn't give the heart much of a wiggle room to increase the oxygen extraction during strenuous situations. And while extraction can rise up to 90%, 
the main way the heart increases its oxygen supply is via autoregulation. Now before we get to that, we have to know a few more rote learning facts. So a normal resting heart will use 10 ml of oxygen per minute in a resting state. Because the extraction of oxygen is so high, you can expect that the partial pressure of oxygen in the venous blood coming from the coronary circulation is going to be really low and the partial pressure is roughly reported at 20 millimeters of mercury. So then how does the heart increase its oxygen supply in a stressful situation? Well, there's three mechanisms by which coronary blood flow can be regulated. The first one is a physical mechanism. This states that the principal factor responsible for perfusion of the myocardium is the aortic pressure. As such, a change in perfusion pressure leads to a change in coronary blood flow. Therefore, coronary perfusion pressure is a key determinant of coronary blood flow. The way we put this into an equation, and this is a very important equation to know that you will put in multiple SAQs, is that coronary perfusion pressure is equal to the aortic root pressure minus the bigger of the left ventricular diastolic pressure or the right atrial pressure. What this equation is saying in simple terms is that if left ventricular and diastolic pressure become so big that it's bigger than the aortic root pressure, then no coronary perfusion pressure will be able to be generated to allow coronary blood flow to occur. And in fact, this actually occurs for coronary blood flow from the left coronary artery. During the start of systole, in isovolumetric contraction, when the left ventricle hasn't opened up its aortic valve, the pressure inside is so high that it's waiting to build up until the pressure exceeds the pressure in the aortic root so that the valve can open up. During this phase of coronary blood flow perfusion to the left ventricle, the blood flow actually becomes negligible to the point where it's zero and reverses back into the systemic circulation. Then as systole continues, the pressure within the left ventricle starts to decrease and that blood flow during systole to the left side of the heart starts to slowly increase. In comparison, you don't see that same effect with the right ventricle. This is because the right ventricle doesn't generate that same right ventricular end diastolic pressure that the left ventricle does. And so coronary blood flow is more evenly distributed between systole and diastole in the right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. The end result is that you get an even 50% of coronary blood flow in systole and diastole to the right ventricle. However, in systole, you only get 25% of the blood flow going into the left ventricle. The majority of the blood flow actually occurs during diastole. This is the main reason why in patients with vulnerable hearts, an increased heart rate which decreases the diastolic time, therefore decreases the time where the left ventricle is getting the majority of its coronary blood flow, can be such a massive effect on that balance between myocardial O2 supply versus demand. Now there is a couple of graphs that you need to know that depict this information and you could be either shown this in a Viva setting or asked to draw it in a Viva setting. On the x-axis you have coronary blood flow in mils per minute and on the y-axis you have time. And the graph depicts what happens in systole and diastole for the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. What you get for the right coronary artery is a curve that looks like your classic arterial waveform trace. What you get for the left coronary artery is a trace that's best described as a swan neck appearance. The key components being a distinct decrease in blood flow at the start of isovolumetric contraction, followed by a gradual recovery, then another decrease in blood flow at the start of diastole, followed by a major upstroke of blood flow during the remainder of diastole. You can find this diagram on MAC95, but you do need to have a look at it just to understand the concept before you do both the SAQ or the VIVA. Now the second component that regulates coronary blood flow is both neural and neurohumeral factors. These really have a minor effect compared to the other factors. 
So the neural factors refers to the sympathetic nervous system causing an activation that leads to an increase in heart rate and contraction. Overall, what it does is it creates more time in systole and restricts the overall coronary blood flow time. However, additionally, with the sympathetic nervous system, you do have some alpha and beta receptors. The alpha receptors lead to vasoconstriction. This will again lead to a decrease in blood flow. However, the beta receptors lead to a dilation of the blood vessels, which will improve blood flow. Overall, the effect of these receptors is very minor in the overall effect of regulating coronary blood flow. They're more important in regulating factors like chronotropy, inotropy, and leucotropy. And a similar thing can be said with the parasympathetic nervous system, which via the vagus nerve releases the acetylcholine acting on muscarinic receptors. This leads to vasodilation by the release of nitric oxide on the coronary vessels, leading to a slight increase in coronary blood flow. This leads us to our third and final factor that regulates coronary blood flow, and by far the most important factor, and this is metabolic autoregulation. Studies have shown a clear relationship between the local myogenic effects of increasing metabolic activity and the linear effects of increasing coronary blood flow. The main determinants of this is that with increasing metabolic activity, you get the increased buildup of substances like CO2, a decrease in oxygen concentration, an increase in hydrogen production, potassium, adenosine, nitric oxide, as well as lactate. All of these lead to activation of potassium sensitive channels within the blood vessels which causes vasodilation and improves coronary blood flow. And this is a really important safety mechanism in the heart. The way the heart gets more oxygen supply is by improving its coronary blood flow. Now, just like any other major organ, the heart also has a degree of local myogenic autoregulation. This is the concept that the blood pressure is kept within a narrow limits across a wide range of coronary perfusion pressures. Now for the heart, the values can vary depending on different texts. I have between 60 to 180 coronary perfusion pressure. The coronary blood flow stays relatively stable. And this is mainly through the myogenic mechanisms. So when you have increased metabolic activity, you get a decrease in coronary resistance. And when you have a decrease in metabolic activity, you get an increase in coronary resistance. This is similar, but subtly different to metabolic autoregulation, which relies on the buildup of metabolic end products to cause a change in vascular resistance. Here with myogenic autoregulation, it's the change in coronary perfusion pressure, which alters coronary blood flow. So that was a quick overview of the three main factors that affect oxygen supply, being the physical factors, the neural and neurohumeral factors, and then the autoregulation factors. So now let's look at the factors that affect myocardial oxygen demand. Now there's a whole host of factors, and in my list I have nearly eight, and not all of the factors are as equal or as important as each other. So some basic numbers again. At rest, the myocardial oxygen demand is eight mils of oxygen per 100 grams per minute. At exercise, this can increase up to 70 mils of oxygen per 100 grams per minute. And at maximum inotropy, so maximum force of contraction, this can increase to 90 mils per 100 grams per minute. Out of those eight determinants that I have on my list, the three most important are firstly, the wall tension, also known as the ventricular wall stress. This utilizes approximately 40% of the oxygen that's supplied to the heart and ventricular wall stress can be expressed using Laplace's formula, which is that the pressure times the radius is divided by two times wall thickness. So if you increase pressure of the heart or you increase the radius of a chamber, say what you see with dilated cardiomyopathy, you increase the overall ventricular wall stress. That's why as a compensatory mechanism, you get increasing thickness of your left ventricular muscle to decrease that amount of ventricular wall stress. Remember, thickness is on the denominator, so if you increase thickness, you'll decrease the overall number. The second important factor is the heart rate itself. 
So this takes between 15 to 25 percent of the oxygen consumption and it's quite basic to understand. If you increase heart rate, you'll increase the amount of oxygen that's needed. There is almost a perfect linear relationship between increasing heart rate and increasing oxygen demand. Then the third important factor is contractility. So this utilizes 10 to 15 percent of the oxygen that's supplied to the heart and again if you increase the contractility, you increase the work the heart puts in, and if you increase the work, you increase the oxygen it needs. Out of the remaining five factors, the two that take up the most is afterload. It's similar to wall tension or ventricular wall stress, but slightly different. This is looking at mainly the afterload that the heart is pumping against, not the afterload that's within the heart chamber itself. And this uses 10 to 15% of the oxygen supply. We have the basal consumption of the heart itself. So this is all the oxygen that's needed for the cells to work at their normal optimal level. And this uses 25% of the oxygen that's supplied. Then the three remaining factors all contribute very little to oxygen demand. The interesting one on this list is preload. You think that changing preload would use more oxygen, but because preload uses the Frank Starling mechanism, which actually optimizes the sarcomere length, you're not actually increasing the oxygen or the ATP demand by the myosin or the actin. You have the electrical activity of the heart, which uses 1% of oxygen, and then you have the stroke work. The stroke work is just an equation to say what is the change in pressure times the change in volume within the heart. Now the heart is pretty nifty in the sense that it can use many substrates to provide an oxygen source. It doesn't have to rely solely on glucose. Carbohydrates make up 40% of its oxygen source. And here you have special GLUT1 and GLUT4 receptors that can increase in amount during an ischemic event. Then you have fatty acids, which are the main substrate and supply 60% of the energy. Amino acids make up less than 5%. And the heart can also use anaerobic glycolysis and lactate as an energy source. This brings us to the end of understanding our second learning objective. And with that, we're going to look at some of the past SAQs that have been asked on this topic. The first SAQ was from the ANSCII exam. It was very recent in 2023 second sitting, and I think it's a really tough SAQ. It was compare and contrast myocardial oxygen supply to the left and right ventricles. Within the examiner report, the domains I wanted you to cover were the similarities and differences between the left ventricle and right ventricle as it relates to the phasic nature of the coronary blood flow, the determinants of coronary perfusion pressure, coronary artery anatomy, autoregulation, and the control of coronary blood flow as compared to arterial oxygen content. You could score more marks if you had that graph that explained the left ventricle versus right ventricle coronary blood flow. The biggest error here seemed to be the fact that people omitted talking about the right ventricle at all or that people started talking about the factors that affect myocardial oxygen demand. So if I was to lay out this question as a model answer, I think it lends itself really well as soon as you hear the words compare and contrast to a table format. You need to be thinking of some headings that can go along the side of that table. And really, both ventricles are very similar when it comes to the determinants that we spoke about that affect oxygen supply apart from one. So the three determinants we spoke about were pressure, or more so coronary perfusion pressure, neural and neurohumeral, and then autoregulation, which includes both metabolic autoregulation and myogenic autoregulation. These would be my basic headings, and then you could flesh them out a lot more as you fill in the table. To start, I would have a fluffy statement saying what is coronary blood flow. So this is the amount of blood that's going to the heart. It's equal to 250 mils per minute, which is equal to 80 mils per minute per 100 grams of heart tissue. The normal supply of oxygen is approximately 50 mils of oxygen per minute or 15 mils of oxygen per 100 grams of heart tissue. Now, not all of that gets used. As we know, the extraction ratio is 65 to 75%. So the normal oxygen demand at rest is approximately 10 mils of oxygen per minute. Then my next heading would be oxygen supply. So I would say that both ventricles receive the same oxygen supply, and this is based on the amount of oxygen carried within the arterial blood times the coronary blood flow. I would then plug in the equation really quickly and then move on to my next heading, 
which I think is really important in this question, and that is the blood supply to each one of these ventricles. In this question particularly, they're not looking for an in-depth knowledge of the anatomy of the blood supply. They just want the broad brush strokes. So the left ventricle is mainly supplied by two major arteries. This is your left anterior descending and your left circumflex. And your right ventricle is mainly done by your right coronary artery through your posterior descending artery. Then I would go on to my next big heading, which is going to be coronary perfusion pressure. And this is where you're going to be spending most of your time because this is really where the difference in supply exists. Here you could lay out your equation as a subheading. So coronary perfusion pressure is equal to aortic root pressure minus the bigger of left ventricular end diastolic pressure or right atrial pressure. You could then try to explain the difference by either writing it out or drawing that graph that we spoke about. Now there's a really good photo of that graph in power and cam. You need to be really careful with your numbers on your x-axis and y-axis. So the y-axis is the amount of blood that's being delivered. So it's going to be in mils per minute. And your x-axis is going to be time. And this is the time representation of what's happening in systole and diastole in both the left ventricle and in the right ventricle. The key here is understanding that the left ventricle is a much more bulkier muscle. And therefore the pressure it generates at the end of diastole is so high that it limits the coronary blood flow by making the coronary perfusion pressure almost zero. This then gets compensated during diastole where 75% of the blood flow occurs. So remember, the curve for the left ventricle looks like a swan neck. You get a massive down spike at the start of systole corresponding with isovolumetric contraction. Here the flow is nearly zero or slightly below zero. Then as systole progresses, you get flow up to 20 mils per minute, decreasing back down as we get closer to diastole. You get a further decrease as we start diastole and then a sharp increase. At the point of the sharp increase, the flow in the left coronary artery can increase up to 100 mils per minute of blood. And then this flow starts to decrease as we progress through diastole, getting closer to systole. In comparison, within the right ventricle, the flow from the right coronary artery as we hit systole increases. It doesn't reach the same peaks as the left coronary artery because it's more evenly distributed. So in systole getting flows of approximately 10 to 15 mils per minute, and then that flow is continuing on in the diastolic period. The way you would write this down is that the flow going to the right ventricle based on coronary perfusion is equal 50% and 50% in systole and diastole. Because this section will take you time to write out and draw, I would have my next section being autoregulation and here divided into metabolic and myogenic. The key difference between the left ventricle and right ventricle is very obvious. You can simply say that the left ventricle is more bulkier and has a greater mass compared to the right ventricle, which has a lower mass, therefore resulting in less net metabolic activity. And this is kind of where the lines blur when you talk about demand versus supply. The key is to link it back into talking about supply. So the fact that the LV has more metabolic activity means that it produces more metabolic components. This leads to the opening of the vessels through vasodilation and improves oxygen supply. Then the final heading in your table would be the neural and neurohumeral control. And here both ventricles are the same. So coronary artery vascular resistance is under autonomic control on both sides. And this has a minimal overall effect in changing oxygen supply. I think this would be more than enough that you need to write in the 10 minutes you have for a pretty complex SAQ. The next SAQ is the one that gets asked all the time and it's been repeated three times already. And this is describe the determinants of the left ventricle myocardial oxygen supply and demand. So it's pretty much a copy and paste of the learning objective. The last time this was asked was back in 2020 with the pass rate of 62%. And here the examiner report was pretty straightforward. They did say that a brief description of the anatomy and normal blood flow rates was useful by candidates as a starting point. And I think if I was to try to do a model answer to this, I would just bang out some facts as fast as possible. So I'd start off by saying what normal blood supply is to the heart, again, 250 mils per minute, being 5% of cardiac output, what the normal oxygen supply is, so roughly 15 mils 
per 100 grams of tissue is how much O2 is delivered. The normal demand at rest is roughly 10 mils. This is because the oxygen extraction ratio is very high, being 65 to 75%. Then I would divide this question into two headings, being the oxygen supply to the left ventricle, and the second being the oxygen demand to the left ventricle. Under my heading for oxygen supply, I would say that the oxygen supply is determined by the amount of oxygen carried in arterial blood times coronary blood flow. Plug in the formula for oxygen content within arterial blood. And then plug in the formula for coronary blood flow, which follows the classic Ohm's law pattern, which is that coronary blood flow is equal to coronary perfusion pressure divided by coronary vascular resistance. Coronary perfusion pressure can therefore be said to be the aortic root pressure minus the bigger of the left ventricular pressure or the right atrial pressure. And that this specifically is a very important factor for the left ventricle because of the high pressures that are generated during systole. Therefore, my factors would be 1, the pressure gradient, 2, autoregulation, 3, neural and neurohumeral components. Then to finish the myocardial oxygen supply component, I would have a fluffy statement to say that because of the fact that extraction ratio is so high, the main way to improve oxygen supply is to modify coronary blood flow. Then going into talking about myocardial oxygen demand of the left ventricle, you would just have those eight bullet points, but really you need to remember the first three. The first one being wall tension or ventricular wall stress. This is governed by Laplace's law, which is equal to the pressure times the radius divided by two times the wall thickness. The second factor is heart rate. Then the third important point is contractility. Then you have all the other factors such as afterload. So the amount of effort the heart is putting in to pump blood against the resistance. You have the basal consumption being 25% of oxygen demand. You have the electrical activity and preload taking a significantly less amount of oxygen demand. And then you have stroke work, which is a combination of the pressure work times the volume work. Finally, to finish, you've listed all these facts. So you need to show some understanding and linkage between them. So you, therefore you can have a fluffy statement to demonstrate this and it needs to be only a line or two. You can simply say that there's a delicate balance between supply and demand to the left ventricle and that these components are interconnected. An example being an increase in heart rate, which increases the demand, but decreases the supply, but through metabolic autoregulation, it can be commonly compensated for by increasing coronary blood flow. However, in compromised patients, such as those with coronary artery disease, this compensation is very limited. Then the final SAQ I want to talk about is from the Kikim exam in 2021. They've actually asked this three times within the Kikim exam, and it was describe the adult coronary circulation being 50% and its regulation being the other 50%. The reason I bring up this question is that we haven't yet been asked to directly talk about the anatomy of coronary blood supply. And the other trick here is that they're asking about the whole coronary supply. So don't just get fixated on the arterial component. Remember to include the venous component. So the arterial component can be divided into the main left coronary artery and the main right coronary artery and its branches. So on the left side, you have the left circumflex, which divides into its obtuse marginals. And then you have the left anterior descending, which divides into its marginal branches. On the right hand side, you have the branch to the SA node, the branch to the AV node, and most importantly, the posterior descending artery. This is the one that determines the dominance, whether you have a right side of dominant pattern or a left side of dominant circulation. And then when it comes to the venous structure, they run alongside these major arteries. So you have the great cardiac vein, which runs along the LAD. You have the middle cardiac vein, which runs along the PDA. You have the small cardiac vein, which runs alongside the marginal arteries. And then you have the oblique vein, which runs along the left atrium, kind of mirroring the left circumflex. An additional point you might want to put in here that might just take an extra minute would be saying what an infarction at any of these territories would show on an ECG. Then you would go and talk about the regulation in this question. And this is just another way to ask about the supply and demand relationship. So again, it's the quick bullet points that you need. And here, because they've only allocated 50% of the time, you just need quick bullet points. So that brings us to the end of today's podcast. Like I said, it's a pretty straightforward podcast talking about oxygen supply and demand, but these key concepts are really important to understand now as they're useful not only for your part one, but for your part two studying. 
An example of this is the number of times you get asked in your part two studying, how are you gonna deal with an intraoperative MI? And you go back to these basic principles of manipulating oxygen supply while decreasing the demand. Next podcast, we'll be back talking about the control of cardiac output and pressure. This is a topic which is very graph heavy. So I'll be putting a lot of links and talking about a lot of the graphs that you see in the common text, such as power and cam. And this again is a really important topic because we're going to go through some basic definitions of preload, afterload, contractility, look at the graph of pressure volume relationships, which is really important and really good viva fodder. So until then guys, I wish you all the best of luck with your studying and I'll catch you next time on Counter 10.